We've all been hurt. We all carry scars. We can all overcome these things and be healed through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's build that relationship together right here. Welcome to Healing Scars with Pastor Burton. Hey everybody, welcome back to the sanctuary. Thank you all for joining us. And for those of you who are new, welcome. It's so good to have you here. Now, as normal, every so often, we do start with a, a bit of an update, and, and uh, today is no different. This year, the big focus has been on going through the least preached books of the Bible, and to date, we've almost gone through all of them. Out of the 10 least preached books, we've actually gone through eight, and in the course of it, We've actually gone through nine of the shortest books in the Bible. Now, of course, studying all them has taken a little while. However, I do encourage all of you to go back and to read through them on your own. All right. So one of those things, you know, even though, you know, I'm that type, we go through word by word. I don't ever want everybody to just take my word for it. I want everybody to go through and learn and study for themselves. And, and you'll actually find that you can read through all of uh, the combined 10 books within just, you know, a, a few hours, you know, the, for the average reader, um, you know, I, I actually looked it up online, and I believe it said it t takes about two to three hours uh, for the average reader. So some of you will get through it a little bit faster, some of you, you know, maybe a little slower, but not by much, um, you know, and if you need a list uh, of uh, all these books, um, all of them that we've gone through and what we still need to finish off, uh, you know, connect with me, send me a message, you know, uh, uh, maybe send a DM on Facebook, um, you know, or, or even email. Of course, you know, email is right there on the website. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of ways to, to get in touch, and I'd be more than happy to provide that list for you. Now, uh, today, we're actually going to continue on that journey, and we'll be going into another of the least preached books of the Bible in Zephaniah. Now, for those keeping tabs, you'll see that it's in a particularly small section of the Bible near the end of the Old Testament. And it's right behind a couple of books that we just completed, uh, Nahum and Habakkuk, uh, and before another book that we went through a little ways back in Haggai. Now, it's interesting because these books, as we've been seeing, they contain just so much. They are a wealth of information. However, regularly, they're just skimmed through by the vast majority, you know, or they just have little pieces, you know, taken from them and viewed when really they need to be studied thoroughly and they need to be read through. Uh, you know, like I said, you know, that's what we've been seeing. There's just so much that gets missed here. Um, which which is unfortunate because there's no there's no reason for that, uh, you know. As we know, uh, God's word, the Bible here, it, it's great for teaching, you know, and rebuking, uh, and, and you know, it's it's God's word. It's part of how He He talks to us. So we need to hear what He has for us. Now, interestingly enough, the book of Zephaniah, it's chronologically out of order. See, Zephaniah, he was actually the prophet before Habakkuk, but the book comes after. And, and, and the book of Zephaniah was likely written towards the end of Zephaniah's ministry, which took place from approximately 740 B.C. till about 621 B.C., which is when Habakkuk actually became a prophet. Uh, this was also uh, during the time of uh, King Josiah's reign and his reforms. Now, King Josiah, he rose to power after a couple of just really evil kings, uh, Manasseh and Ammon. And, and during that time, this is also the time that Assyria was starting to crumble as a world superpower. You know, their, their dominance was just, it wasn't there anymore. Uh, and, and during, during uh, you know, uh, Josiah's reign, he had started a revival, 
which we can we can see and learn more about in Second Kings chapter twenty two verse one through chapter twenty three uh, verse twenty five, uh, and this is this revival was actually helped by Zephaniah's writing here. So Zephaniah is you know believed to have actually contributed um, to it. Uh, unfortunately, this revival was very short lived. Uh, Zephaniah, you know, he he wrote this book to uh, the Israelites, um, you know, for the the people of Judah, in, in, in an attempt to get them to snap out of their complacency and to turn back to God. You know, and, and this is one of those times that we see in the Bible, you know, God, he'd sent a warning. He was like, you know, Hey, you better stop. You better stop. Or this is going to happen. There's going to be consequences, you know? And, and it was also, it served as a way as basically a guide, um, to bring his people back to him before it was too late, which, you know, as, as Christians, as followers of Christ answering the great commission, that's something we should all be trying to do is to, to reach out to people and, you know, introduce them so that they can come to know God, and, you know, and, and be saved. You know, so it's our job to make the introduction, and then God saves. Uh, you know, people people make that choice for themselves. You know, and as we go through this book, uh, there are three themes that we're going to see: uh, a day of judgment, which is coming in the very very near future, uh, and we're going to see an indifference to God. And uh, thirdly, we're going to see a day of joy and restoration. It sounds beautiful, doesn't it? It's because it will be. Now, as we go through this book, we're also going to find that there are really two overall sections to it. Uh, The Day of Wrath, which covers the first two chapters and a piece of the third. And then we're also going to see the day of hope, which covers the remainder um, there, that final chapter. So the overall message that we're going to see is that the day is coming when God's going to hand out punishment for all nations, all nations, everyone. We're talking Enough is enough. I've had it. It's time to lay the smack down. All right. And and for those who are faithful, however, there is hope. See, for Christians, for followers of Christ, those of us who are faithful through thick and thin, the Lord will be merciful. So to all the, the you know those who are doing evil, the bad, and all that, the wicked, you know what? Hey. They're they're gonna push that hand, and they're gonna and judgment's gonna come down on them, all right. Uh, but for those of us who are faithful and, and doing the things that we're supposed to, there's hope because God's going to be merciful. You know, essentially think of it like this. Think back to a time in your youth when you messed up, when you're told those famous words. Go to your room. And then you're in there and you're waiting for that come to Jesus talk. And you know, there's a good chance there's probably going to be a whooping afterwards. You know, that's just the way it is. That, that's that's essentially how this book is is being played out. All right. And, and, and you know, you think of it, you know, it's kind of, you know, if, if you tell me the truth, it's going to be better for you than if you don't. If you keep on lying to me, it's going to get rough. It, 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 that's exactly what we're looking at here. All right, so let's get started with our reading. For those of you uh, with your Bible and those of you who are taking notes, we're going to go in now. So join me in Zephaniah chapter 1, and we're going to start with verses 1 through 3. Uh, the Bible says, The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, during the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, I will sweep away everything 
from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both man and beast. I will sweep away the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and the idols that cause the wicked to stumble. When I destroy all mankind on the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Now, Judah had been warned. You know, God, God had said it out. Hey, you better knock it off or else. However, they chose not to listen. Now, it's unclear if they didn't listen because they didn't believe in the prophet that was in front of them. Or if they questioned God. Or just plain doubted God anyway. You know, in, in, in any case... We need to remember that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because of that, so is his word. He doesn't go back on his promises. All right. Now, if we allow ourselves to become arrogant, like the people of Judah, well, just like them, the day is going to come when we're standing tall on the day of judgment, and we're going to have to answer for our sins. Now, as we're seeing, this is calling things into the big picture, going all the way back to creation. Because I mean, you look at it, it, it talks about, you know, man and the beast, you know, it's, it's going all the way back. And, you know, God has blessed the world with all these wonderful creations. However, on that day of judgment, when it, when it, when it's when justice is handed down, you know, keep in mind it's because we force his hand as disobedient children. It's not because he wants to. It's not something he's looking forward to, you know. Just like any parent, you know, he doesn't want to have to punish, you know, the, the children. Um, but it's it, it is because of our disobedience, and he's going to take it all away, all of it, every little piece of it. He's going to wipe that slate clean. Just like when, you know, you got in trouble growing up. You know, many of us, you know, we got in trouble and, and your parents took things away from you. Those of you who are parents now, you know, I'm sure you've taken things away from your kids. Uh, TVs, video game systems, you know. Uh, well, I'm dating myself a little bit, you know, stereos. Uh, you know, I, I recall a number of years back, one of my kids decided he wanted to slam the door to his room and lock it. Well, that didn't happen again. Because he didn't have a door after that. It was quickly taken off the hinges and relocated to the garage where it stayed for a significant amount of time. Um, you know, and that's mild. That is very mild compared to what the father is going to do when it's time to hand down justice. You know, when judgment comes. Now, continuing on in uh, Zephaniah uh, chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 4 through 6 now. The Bible says... I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all who live in Jerusalem. I will destroy every remnant of Baal worship in this place. The very names of the idolatrous priest, those who bow down on roofs to worship the starry host, those who bow down and swear by the Lord, and who also swear by Moloch. The Hebrew of that is Malcolm. Those who turn back from following the Lord and neither seek the Lord nor inquire of him. So obviously, idols were a huge issue here. And much like today, they were prominent. They were everywhere, as was the worship of them. You know, and I'll remind you, an idol is anything that is admired or loved more than God. Let me say that again. An idol is anything that is admired or loved more than God. Much like when people can tell you all about an athlete's stats, but when it comes to the scripture, they're a blank slate. You know, they, they, they can... They can 
maybe come up with some garbage that they found on social media or some false teaching that was handed out that people believe is in the Bible and isn't. But when it comes to actual scripture, they've got nothing for you, you know, and, and people, they'll go for, beyond that. You know, they'll make themselves idols for that matter, you know, and that's when you trust in yourself more than you trust in God, you know, uh, money, politicians, Cars, houses, careers, social media, social status, cell phones, video games, TV and radio programs for that matter, uh, you know, movie experiences. You know, these are all just examples of the multitudes of idols that exist today, some of the most common. You know, and people, you know, people, they'll, they'll know exactly what an actor is up to or when a musical artist is coming to town. But they can't tell you what the Pentateuch is or the books of the gospel. Anything that comes before God in your life is an idol, guys. Anything. God needs to be first and foremost before anything and everything. And those idols, while they might provide some sense of immediate gratification now, you know, they keep you occupied now, ultimately... They're going to prove to be insufficient, empty, worthless, and disappointing. And the time's going to come for many of us that we're going to regret the fact that we've wasted as much time as we have with them. And let them, inf- you know, the fact that we let them infringe on that time that we could have been spending with Jesus. Matthew 6, verse 33 The Bible says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. When God comes first, everything else is icing on the cake. Things fall into place so much better. And your successes, and you will have them, they're a gift and a testament to God's glory. So, going back, when the Israelites had arrived, you know, to, to this territory, when they moved into the, to this land, God had told them to go and completely get rid of all the pagans that had been there. But they didn't. And, and because of this, they were influenced, uh, you know, by them and by their idols, they, like, greatly so. There was a lot of influence, um, you know, the people, their idols, you know, their ways, you know, the, the Israelites had questions and they dug into them instead of listening to God. And, and, and so much so, you know, that they started to worship the idols themselves. That's how wrapped up they got, you know, and we see that with a lot of the, the ancient mythologies, you know, coming into today's, uh, you know, society, you know, someone dies you know, especially in the military or in first response, like law enforcement or the fire, you know, fire rescue and all that stuff. You know, someone dies and there's always some idiot that's like, till Valhalla. But they want to say they're a Christian. You know, what? if you're a Christian, stop doing and saying unchristian things. That is, you know, till Valhalla. Guess what? You know, it's it, it's a slogan. It's a catchphrase. You know, these days, and it's very much put out there before God. Was there even a consideration like, you know what? Hey, um, you know, we need to bring God into this picture, you know, pray for the families and everything. Were they a Christian? You know, all that kind of, you know, were they a believer or whatever? No, it's just right. Oh, it's still Valhalla, brother. We'll see you at the table and all, you know, all that garbage and nonsense. No, it needs to stop. It needs to stop. And a lot of us as Christians, we don't think of that. We just fall right into it. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's that's a great thing. It's a mighty thing. Yeah, they're at the great feast now. And it's like, no, that, that we need to stop that. See, pagans that were already there, they had a god for anything and everything. You know, just like the Greeks, just like the Romans did, just like the Norse did, and so many others. You know, and, and as the Israelites began to include those in their lives and include those people in their lives, they began to turn away from God. And, and, and it was a very quick turn. You know, in the process, 
they began to turn on those who were poor and vulnerable. Poor and vulnerable. We see that a lot today, don't we? Our veterans and our first responders who are put on just this high pedestal when we're in uniform, but then quickly discarded as damaged goods that are better off forgotten when that time of service ends and that uniform comes off. You know, we, we, we see that daily. And, and, you know, we need to be careful and evaluate how we turn from God in our own lives. And, you know, how we start giving preference to other things in our lives that take us away from the Father. Not only that, but we need to ensure that we don't become polytheistic. Now, for you know, for those who don't know what polytheistic is or what polytheism is, um, that is the worship of many gods. Now, the Bible makes it very clear, and I'm here to tell you, you cannot worship the Father and other idols at the same time. It doesn't work. In Leviticus, we've even been warned not to do this. As Christians, we only worship the one true God. Anything else is a sin. Period. End of story. You know, idolatry, that, that is the devil's work. That is the devil's playground. That's how he turns us away from God. So we have to be especially careful. Now, let's pick back up in Zephaniah chapter 1 here, verses 7 through 9. The Bible says, Be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated those he has invited. On the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all those clad in foreign clothes. On that day, I will punish all who avoid stepping on the threshold. This is a reference to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 5, verse 5, uh, for those who want to look at that. Um, so, um, on that day, I will punish all who avoid stepping on the threshold, who fill the temple with their gods, with violence and deceit. In other words... Judgment's coming, and justice is coming with it. Now, the prophet Zephaniah saw what was to come. He knew what was coming, and he knew, you know, he knew without a doubt that it was coming. But what he didn't know was when it was going to come. Or, you know, he he, he basically he just he knew what was up. That was it. It was what he did know was it was going to be in their lifetime and it was going to be at the hands of the Babylonians. Now we see he doesn't mention them by name though. And most likely this was to keep the focus on God and not the pagans that were going to be a tool of of, of God's judgment upon them. All right. The focus needed to be on God, just like today. Um, and as we see in verses eight through nine, it, it wasn't a matter of just fo- you know of following local trends, you know, because the leaders who just like today should have been setting the best examples. Th- instead, they were doing. You know, they, they they were engaged in adopting the pagan practices, the the fashions of the day. You know, falling in line with what's cool. You know, they they were woke to the movement. You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and it's very much like today's um, pressure. You know, to accept all those unbiblical things. You know, so if you're not supportive and you're not encouraging, you know, then then you know you're you're a bad person. You know, and it's which is garbage. You know, it, that. Just like back then, that was a slap in the face of God. Just like today, it's a slap in the face of God. It is a display of just utter contempt towards Him. Have you ever thought of that? You know, when 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 uh, you're like, oh, I don't, you know, I I don't want to alienate anybody. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings or any of that. Well, you know what? 
when it comes to the truth, if the truth hurts, so be it. Because the truth is what needs to be put out there. You know, as the Bible tells us, the, the truth is what sets people free. The truth is not always going to be a comfortable thing. That's what our conviction is, after all, right? It's not comfortable. Sometimes that's what people need. Actually, oftentimes, that's what people need. You know, when we go out and we support things that we know promote sin, we're effectively spitting in the face of Jesus. Going to parades, wearing clothing, putting stickers on things, allowing for our kids to be told this is a good thing, that this is how we show love. No, we're showing contempt for what Jesus has done for us. You know, you get all these groups and they go out there and they like to say, love is love, love, love. As if you don't love someone when you tell them that they're wrong about something. That in itself is contrary to what Jesus has taught us. If you love someone, then you need to tell them when they're wrong. And by telling them that they're wrong, that in itself is is a show of love. That is a display of love. You know, and it's the same thing at work, even. None of us like getting in trouble. None of us like to be the one who's messing something up. However, if we are messing something up, if we are doing something incorrectly, then we want to know so that we can fix it. And if someone loves you, they're going to say, hey, you need to stop doing that and you need to start doing this instead. It is not an insult. It is not something to take offense of. It is a loving gesture from one person to another to ensure that the wrong things are stopped and the right things are started. Okay? That's all it is. That is a loving gesture. To correct somebody or to help someone to correct something that they're doing, that is a sign of love. Do you go into surgery and just get, you know, put under for the doc to go in and do their thing and then sent on your way? No. A checklist has gone through. What's being done? Where it's being done? You know, your clothing is getting changed. Uh, medications are discussed. Allergies are discussed. Expectations are set. Emergency contacts and so on and so forth. There's so much put into place. A lot of things happen. And there's a process to make sure that the right thing is, do is done. For the right reason with the right person. Why? Because at some point someone messed up. And it's, just, it's what they're doing is to make sure that doesn't happen again. So to take care of people, certain processes have been implemented for everyone involved. Addressing people's sin is no different. If you love someone and they're messing up, you need to tell them that they're messing up. You know, and while that's just one example, there's so many out there. Think of flight checklist, right? Camping checklist. You know, there's so many checklists out there. Why? It's to make sure that the right things are done to take care of people. All right, continuing on now. Uh, join me now in Zephaniah 1. We're going to look at verses 10 through 13 now. Uh, and the Bible says, On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will go up from the fish gate, wailing from the new quarter and a loud crash from the hills. Wail you who live in the market district. Depending on your translation, that might say mortar. All your merchants will be wiped out. All who trade with or in silver will be destroyed. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish those who are complacent, who are like wine left on its dregs, who think the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. Their wealth will be plundered, their houses demolished. Though they build the houses, they will not live in them, though. They plant vineyards. They will not drink the wine. God was going to go through 
and weed out everyone who tried to excuse their own sins. That's what this is saying here. The, the people who not only didn't examine themselves and what was in their hearts, but sat around on their laurels watching the moral chaos that was going on in the world around them. You know, those people that were complacent and, and, you know, we all know the type. Those that think, oh, it doesn't impact me. So, you know, so what? Uh, It's not my battle. Uh, I don't need it. They could care less. They don't think that God would get involved, uh, you know, or, you know, that he could care less. You know, little did they, they realize that within the next 20 years, the Babylonians not only would come in, but they were literally going to drag people out of hiding. They're going to enslave people and kill others. Not a single person was going to make it out unscathed. And for us today, a lot of people are complacent. They're comfortable in their lives. You know, and they don't see how the things going on around them can impact them. You know, it's it's one of Satan's better tricks, isn't it? They feel like, ah, I'm doing all right. I've got a pretty decent life. I'm a good person. So they don't feel like they need God or really believe in him for their ma- that matter. Like, oh, I don't need religion. I don't need, you know, any of that stuff. You know, others like to think of him you know, you know, that, that do believe that there's a God, they, they tend to think that, you know, he's like that uncle or that grandfather that just kind of, they hang around, but they don't really do anything. They don't really have anything to offer, you know, anybody in life, you know, they're cool to hang out with. They, you know, maybe they have some cool stories, uh, but you know, when, when, when something happens and you need someone you could depend on, they're not the person you call, you know, here, here's the thing though. God is real. God is real. And he's only going to let us push that line so far. We can't afford to be indifferent. You may feel that you're safe out there, but you're not. You know, Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, the Bible says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you, you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. By being indifferent, you're still turning your back on God. And because of it, you're giving up that gift of salvation that he's trying to give to you. He's given us time so that we have the chance to choose to stand for him. But that time's not infinite. There's no place that we can hide. So we have to look inwards and we have to examine ourselves before it's too late. This is something that we need to do now. So if you haven't, and even if you think you have, I still encourage you, take take a moment, take a look inside, figure out where you were, where you are, and what you need to do to get into alignment with God's word, you know, and with God's will. Because when judgment comes, and justice is handed out, it's going to be too late. So we need to act now. You know, what are the things I'm doing that I need to stop? You know, it's like, I, do I believe in God or don't I? Because your actions are going to dictate that. And your actions, those are the things that we need to change. Right? Now, remind, you know, don't don't take this out of context. I'm not saying your deeds get you into heaven. But your deeds do speak. Speak to what you truly believe in, you know, just, you know, Jesus is our way. You know, he, he is, he has said it himself. He is the way he is the light. That is the way that we get in there by, by believing in Jesus. However, because we believe in, in him, that in itself should make all of us as believers want to change things in our lives to start trying to root the sin out. Let's see what the rest of this chapter has for us today. So continuing on back in uh, Zephaniah chapter 1, and we're going through verses 14 through 18 now. The Bible says, The great day of the Lord is near. Near and coming quickly, 
The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warrior shouts his battle cry. That day will be the day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. I will bring such distress on all people that they will grope about like those who are blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their entrails and dung, like dung, excuse me. Um, their, let me say, let me go back there. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their entrails like dung. Excuse me, got a little tongue tied there. All right. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his jealousy, the whole earth will be consumed. For he will make a sudden end of all who live on earth. So for Judah, it was a dark day indeed. They're coming up on that finish line real quick. And for us, it's not going to be any different. If we don't turn from our sin now and you know raise our voices up to the Lord, every second that goes by, you know we're, we're closer and closer to judgment. We're closer to justice. And, you know, and if, if you look at what we're just seeing here, you know, it, it's talking about the end. You know, because it's talking about trumpets and battle, right? On, on the day that God's judgment is going to rain down, it is going to be without mercy for the unfaithful. He's promised worldwide destruction, and it will be cleansed of all sin. There's not going to be anything left. Nothing. When the day comes, if you haven't already given yourself to the Lord, you're not going to have anyone to blame but yourself. It's going to be that moment when Jesus says, I told you. I warned you. Why didn't you listen? Now, I know this sounds pretty grim. And to the believer, I'm sorry, to the unbelievers and to the unfaithful, it is. And it's going to be. For Christians, though, for true believers, God's children, for you, for me, there's hope. Jesus sacrificed himself for us. He's paved the way for us. He's standing at the door waiting for us. And in Revelation chapters 20 and 21, God has promised us that there will be a new earth and that we will have new bodies, that he has forgiven us and in his mercy will not reject us because of our faithfulness. If you haven't already accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, now is the time. Jesus has told us it only takes a mustard seed size of faith. It doesn't take a lot. Just a mustard seed size of, uh, piece of faith. And if that's all that you have, that is enough. Because the Lord is going to help it grow. So give yourself over to him and know that you receive his mercy and his love because he does love you. He loves us all. And that's why he's given us this warning so that when the day comes, we're not the ones in trouble. We're the ones who is, he's saying, You've done well, my good and faithful servant. All right, that's all we have time for today. Next time we're going to pick back up and we're going to keep on going through this series. And we're going to we're going to see what else uh, you know, the word has for us and we know it's going to be great. You're loved. You are blessed. So go and be a blessing. Go and go and be the church. I want to thank you for joining us today. 
If you have any questions, prayer requests, or would like to know more about our ministry, you can find us on our website at bethelightsanctuary.org or on Facebook at Be The Light Sanctuary. We'll catch you next time. God bless.